Our first reading is from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 14 through 21. For a long time I have held my peace, I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor, I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do. I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one or blind as the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law and make it glorious. This reading is from Ephesians chapter five, verses eight through 14. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter, select verses. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, this word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him, how he had received his sight. He made mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things that this reading that we just had from John chapter 9 tells us is that our assumptions about God and about ourselves and about sin and about the way that God works in our world, our assumptions about these things can actually blind us to God's truth for us in Christ Jesus. So in the text, Jesus and his disciples encounter a man, and the man has been blind from the time that he was born. And immediately notice that the disciples make 
an assumption. And the assumption that they make is this, is that this man is blind either because his parents sinned in some way or he himself sinned. It's very simple for them. It's one or the other. His parents' fault or his own. What we see in the disciples is a very human tendency in the face of hardship and trouble and suffering in human life to look for answers that are easy for us to comprehend. And and one of the ways that we see it is in this, this question that they ask, right? That tries to get at human fault. Who made it happen? We want to know. Why? Well, because if we know this, if we know that a certain action results in a, in a certain kind of suffering, then wouldn't we try to avoid that same action ourselves so that we will, we will avoid the misery? Or if we see somebody who's going through some kind of suffering, then we would know, well, well, here's why. It's because of something that they have done. We might even derive a certain sense of satisfaction saying, well, that person or that group of people have actually gotten the thing that they deserve. But the answer that Jesus gives, it's not that simple, is it? Speaking of this man who has been born blind, Jesus says in verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And so Jesus wants his disciples and he wants us also to look beyond mere human causes as an explanation to suffering and trouble and trial and rather to trust in God's divine purposes. You know, God has a purpose. In the case of the man who's been born blind, that purpose is going to be what? Well, it's going to, to, it's going to be to heal the man. And not only to heal him of his physical blindness, but to heal him of spiritual blindness too, to, to welcome him in to the very kingdom of God's grace. Now, this doesn't mean that God's purpose is always going to be to take away the afflictions and the sufferings and the troubles that we experience in this world. In fact, can you remember that account in the life of the Apostle Paul? He talks about it in 2 Corinthians, and he talks about a thorn that he has in his flesh. He says that it's something that has come from Satan. And then he tells us that he prayed to God to take it away from him, and he prayed repeatedly. But God said, no. God tells Paul, my grace is enough for you, Paul. And instead, what I'm going to do is I am going to be at work in the midst of your suffering, not to take it away, but to give you strength to endure. My power is made perfect in weakness. Isn't that interesting? Because here you see two very, very different responses on the part of God. In the case of the blind man, he takes away the blindness. In the case of St. Paul, he says, no, I'm going to let your suffering endure. But here's what is the same in both cases, the purpose of God in displaying his grace in human life. John Piper, in expounding on this theme, he points out a profound implication for us in our own lives. Because it tells us that no matter what the struggle, no matter what the pain, no matter what the pandemic might be, the human causes of these things are never enough to explain them. It doesn't mean that there aren't human causes. Very often there are human causes to the things that we suffer in life, and sometimes we are the cause of our own suffering. You can draw a direct line from what we have done to the effect that we suffer. I'll bet you've seen some of these stories in the news. Someone who thinks that they are invincible, who thinks that, well, nothing's going to happen to me, continues to engage in all sorts of activities that expose them to the coronavirus. And then a couple of weeks later, they are posting on social media from a hospital bed connected to a ventilator, and they're saying, don't be dumb like me. See? There's a connection sometimes between what we suffer and what we ourselves have chosen to do. And sometimes 
the connection is not necessarily to something that we have done, but something that someone else has foolishly done that now affects us. So a group of people gets together and they're not being very thoughtful about how their actions might affect someone else. And they say, let's throw grandma a birthday party. And we'll put all 89 candles on her birthday cake. And they're all around and grandma can't blow them all out. And they help her. And now grandma, some of them are in the hospital. Connected to ventilators. Because of the foolish actions of someone else. And, and then sometimes there's this. We, we can't draw a connection between something we've done or something that someone else has done. It is simply the fact that we live in a world that has fallen and broken in all kinds of ways. And we're affected by things like illnesses and, and bacteria and viruses and, and all the rest. But you see, all of these causes, even when we do know what they are, are never enough to determine for us the meaning the significance of that which is taking place in our lives when things are difficult, when we're going through a struggle or a trial. Only God's purposes in Jesus Christ can provide us a meaning that counts. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. In the work of God, purpose of God for the man is going to be good. As you and I acknowledge the broken and sinful world in which we live, as we acknowledge our own sinfulness, as we rest in Jesus as our Savior and our helper in every trouble, in every struggle that we face, we can always be sure in the face of it. God's purposes for us will be good in the end. But here's the thing. You will find no comfort in the purposes of God if you don't value His purposes more than your own. Will you? Psalm 63, verse 3 says, Your love is better than life. Speaking to God, your love, God, is better than life. Do you believe that? Do you believe that that knowing that you have the love of God, that you're living in the love of God right now, and that because of Jesus, you will live forever in the presence of God and His love for you. Do you believe that that is true and that that love of God is better than anything that this life could ever give you? Better than health. Because if you don't believe it, then saying that God is loving and saying that He is wise and saying that He will finally bring about His good purposes in your life is not going to give you any comfort. But if you do believe it, not only will you be comforted, not only will you be strengthened, but you will also more patiently be able to endure whatever you face, including the challenges of this moment in time. Well, how are we to be strengthened in our confidence, in our faith in God's good purposes for us? I think that, that as we look at this text, we can say this, that we are strengthened in the same way that the blind man in the account is healed. How, how was he brought to see God's purposes in Christ for him. And in part, we can say he was brought to that point by a little bit of spit and dirt and mud. Verse 6, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva. He put it on the man's eyes. Now, there's a couple of things that I think are important in that. And briefly, let me begin by saying, I think that this shows us how God loves to work through means. Have you noticed that? God loves to work through means. He could have simply done this. He could have simply told the man, be healed, be seeing, and the man would have seen. Jesus does that on some occasions, but that's not what he does here. What we see Jesus doing is what he so often does, and that is doing the extraordinary, but doing it through the ordinary, and he does that with you and with me every day. 
think about the fact that you exist as a human being, as a physical being, and yet a being that has an immortal soul. That's extraordinary. But it happened for the ordinary. you got two parents. And then think about this, that all throughout the course of your life, God has been, been nurturing your life. He's been feeding you. He's been keeping you alive. He's given you a job if you're, if you're out there in the working world. Think about how he, he, he works in our world to bring crops to harvest. The sun shines, the rain falls, the seeds grow, the farmers harvest. They send grain on trucks out, and eventually you have bread in the grocery aisle. All of these things. Extraordinary when you get down to it, and yet through the ordinary. Behind it all is God, the giver of life, the creator of life. And so we read this text. Jesus spits on the ground and he, and he makes mud and he puts it on the man's eyes. And what do we think? We think, my goodness, what about some social distancing? We think that sounds kind of gross. Why would Jesus do that? Wait a minute. Remember who's doing it. God, the Son. And remember what he's doing it with. When was the last time you remember in the Bible God taking the dust of the earth and making something extraordinary? Back in Genesis, the very first man, Adam, the, the great great, great ancestor of us all. The ancestor of this man whose, whose earthly body is in some way broken and, and doesn't function the way that it should. And so now what happens is the creator in the flesh takes the dust of the earth and he heals the man's eyes. The fourth verse, the very first chapter of this same Gospel of John, speaking about Jesus, says, in him was life in his very spit. Life and light for this broken creature. Well, as surely as Christ worked through the means of mud to bring physical sight into this man's life, well, in a similar way, God works through means, the means of his word that we hear today the means of his sacraments that we have received so many times in our lives to give us spiritual sight so that we may see, so that we may hope in him. But not everybody sees that, do they? Isn't this interesting? Here we are, you know, a little bit after 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, if you're watching at that time online. And, and we're kind of a virtual congregation of Mount Calvary. And, and I hope you, like like I am doing, are taking comfort in the promises and the power of God's Word. But at the very same time that, that we gather to hear God's Word, there are others who don't, others who won't. In fact, there are those, and maybe you've seen some of these kinds of posts, that mock Christians and that denigrate our faith in a God who holds all of humanity and all of human history in his hands. And they say, what kind of God is that? They don't see. Just like the Pharisees in our text today, they don't see. Their own perceptions about what Jesus could do or shouldn't do keep them blind to the power of God that's visible right there before them. The Gospel of John is intentionally being ironic, using the occasion of this blind man to say, look, here's a blind guy who is enabled to see. But here are people who can see but can't see Jesus as their Savior and only hope. I want you to listen again to what it says Picking it up at verse 35, after the man is thrown out of the synagogue, it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? 
Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Notice what it is that brought that man to the point of being able to see Jesus as his helper and savior. What was it? Well, it was Jesus himself. Not a what, but a who. It, it's Jesus who, first of all, reached out to the man. And the man didn't even ask him to. And Jesus healed him of his blindness. Then, when Jesus finds out that he's been kicked out of the synagogue, he tracks him down. And he reveals himself. And the man believes. And he worships Jesus. And then, as we so often find in the Gospels, the man just kind of disappears from the story. We never hear from him again. But we have already seen through him what we need to see, what we need to know. And that is that Jesus and Jesus alone can give to us the spiritual sight that enables us to believe and to rest our lives in him. And how we need that kind of vision. We need it every day. We need it when we're weary. We need it when we're worn out with testing and, and temptation and trial and trouble. We need it in the midst of blessing. And through it all, here's what God would have us see. Number one, God is good. God is loving. And that for his believers, Everything that happens in our lives has an overarching purpose that God himself would use to point us to Christ as our only hope and Savior. Two, it is only through faith in God's good purpose that, that our understanding of what he has done for us in Jesus can ever be perceived. But three, in and of ourselves, we can't see the good purposes of God. We can't see who Jesus is. We can't see what he's done. But God hasn't left us to ourselves. He has sent us Jesus. Jesus is the one who seeks us out. Jesus is the one who works in our lives through the means of his word and sacrament, by the power of the Holy Spirit to open up eyes that have been blinded by sin to give us faith and to make us true worshipers of him. Amen. May this word keep you steadfast in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, you have promised to hear us when we pray in the name of your Son, in the name of Jesus Christ, then hear our prayers today. From all sin, all error, all evil, from the attacks of Satan, from sudden evil death, from disasters, pestilence, pandemic, from war, bloodshed, flood, storm, fire, and especially from everlasting death, O oh Lord, hear our prayer and deliver your people. From the pull of our sinful natures, from the sins of pride, greed, anger, cowardice, lust, laziness, indulgence, envy, from the power of the devil and the temptations of the world, good Lord, hear our prayers and save your people. From sins of the soul, from ignoring your saving word, from coldly resisting the cares of those who are in need around us, from carelessness with holy things, from attitudes and actions that cause us to neglect the blessings of worship and prayer, from stubbornness, fear, failure to act on the word that you have spoken. Good Lord, hear our prayer and defend your people. Raise up in your church those who will spread the word of salvation in Christ. May the church be blessed with faithful pastors and congregations who will cling to your truth in times of both trouble and blessing. We commit to your keeping our own congregation of Mount Calvary. Lord, hear our prayer on behalf of your people. Preserve our nation and president and all who serve in government everywhere that they may be blessed with wisdom during this time of crisis 
and by your direction find solutions that result in the well-being of people both in our nation and across the globe. Be with doctors, nurses, researchers, and all medical professionals who seek to heal and help those affected by the coronavirus and who put themselves at risk in the process. May they know your protection and peace. Guard and protect our loved ones in the military. Good Lord, hear our prayer and prosper our nation under God. O oh Lord, help and sustain those who are sick. In particular, we pray for Jamie Klein, Brianna Hoffman, Lauren Streiner, Chet Weinstroer, together with others that we name before you in our hearts. Comfort the families of those who have died. Especially, we pray for the family of Milton Berg. Hear our prayer for all your children in the face of every trial, providing that help that you know best that they need. Merciful Father, receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning. Today in our gospel, we hear of a time when Jesus meets a man who was born blind. A man who had been blind from birth, who had spent all of his days uh, in darkness, unable to see, not knowing what colors like red or blue or purple looked like, never seeing a sunset or a sunrise, never seeing a starry night. All this man knew was darkness. And Jesus' disciples, they ask, uh, Jesus, why is this man blind? Is it because he had sinned or because his parents had sinned? Uh, is it because he had done something so bad that he deserved not to be able to see? Or is it because his parents had been, been so ornery that, that they deserved to have a son who couldn't see? And so that was their question. They, they believed that there was this link between the darkness he was living, the darkness that he was experiencing by not being able to see, and spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness. That's, that's when we sin. That's when we, when we live according to our ways instead of God's ways. God's way. When we... When we think about ourselves more than we think about God, when we think about ourselves more than others, when we hear God's law or his word and, and we just, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Spiritual darkness is when we refuse to see God. And the truth is, we spend a lot of our time living in spiritual darkness. Uh, by a lot of time, I mean pretty much all of our lives. We, we live in a way that we think only about ourselves. I imagine a lot of you have spent a lot more time at home this week than, than usual. A lot more time around your family. And while that's wonderful, it's given us more opportunities to, to be upset with our brothers and sisters. It's given us more opportunities to argue and fight and whine. Uh, it's given us more opportunities to not listen to our mom and dad or, or to, to be helpful when they ask us, uh, when they give us directions or, or ask us uh, to, to do a chore. Um, it doesn't take very long looking at our own lives to see that. Uh, we're sinful. We're, we're spiritually dark. And not just a little bit, but, but completely and entirely living a life of darkness. Like we can look at the blind man who had lived a whole life with only darkness because he couldn't see anything. That's our spiritual condition. That's who we are. That's how we live. But God, he doesn't leave us in that darkness. No, he, he loves us too much to let us be there. He, just like every morning... He sends the sun to, to get rid of the dark of night. God squashes our darkness. He crushes our spiritual darkness. He obliterates our spiritual darkness by sending his son into the world, by sending Jesus to be born as a baby and, and, and to die on the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he carried our darkness. He carried our spiritual darkness. And when he died on the cross, he destroyed it. He destroyed that darkness. And when he rose again, 
He gave us the life forever that we get through Jesus. Today, uh, in, in the Bible verse, we, we read about a man who, who Jesus healed. He got rid of his darkness. He gave him the opportunity to see the light of day. And the first thing he sees when he opens his eyes is the light of the world, Jesus. And today we celebrate that Jesus is our light, too. He's the light that destroys our darkness. He's the light that gives us the gift of forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life with him in heaven. Uh, today we celebrate the light of the world for you and for me is Jesus. Will you pray with me? Repeat after me and say, Dear God, thank you for Jesus, the light of the world. In Jesus' name.